Mike, I hope uh, that you had a good lunch and uh, you had uh, energy to warm up. Uh, <laughs> We keep on uh, working this uh, scientific uh, workshop uh, based on the accessible uh, robotics technology for farmers. And uh, we start with the third session uh, and the first of the afternoon devoted to safety and integrity of robots in agriculture. And to introduce uh, this session, uh, we welcome uh, Christophe Tissier from uh, the SEMA. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and to... <laughs> to make a so good afternoon everybody I'm not as tall as uh, as Roland so um, so my name is Christophe Tissier uh, I'm a technical advisor in uh, in CIMA CIMA is uh, the European organization um, the funding is interest of uh, manufacturers of agricultural machinery, and uh, the main per the main uh, target of uh, our association is to uh, <coughs> promote machinery and solutions for uh, digital um, for uh, sustainable uh, farming. Uh, and in particular, we are really following and intervening uh, on the European regulations. So my, pre my presentation for the safety aspect will be as a first, um, the first part of this presentation related to all um, the European regulations uh, which are under uh, development uh, to cover uh, in particular um, autonomous mobile machinery, so robots. And the first point, as if it was a homework uh, dedicated to philosophy, uh, is uh, what is a safety, and uh, in our mind we have uh, two main aspects of safe for safety. The first one is uh, related to uh, the road safety, so the circulation on the road, and the second uh, the second one is um, related to the occupational safety, so the work the safety in the working conditions. For the road safety at the present time, there is really a lack of maturity um, on the technical requirements. Uh, we are actually relying on what is done uh, on road for cars and trucks, and uh, still we are waiting for what is done. And uh, so what is important for us is really to uh, focus on occupational safety. I mentioned also that <clears throat> at the present time, the for uh, for on-road uh, circulation, it's uh, really uh, linked to um, a local authorization for, for the traveling, and it's more for crossing a road than uh, traveling uh, along the road. Then, second question uh, is uh, for robots, uh, tractor versus machinery. Um, in uh, the Existing uh, European um, uh, background, we have dedicated regulation for uh, conventional tractors and uh, a specific regulation also uh, for machinery. <clears throat> but when it comes to autonomous tractor, uh, compared to uh, an autonomous, um, well, a tractor is supposed to provide some power, um, uh, and uh, on this. Um, on this tractor, you can fit then an implement which will carry out a specific uh, task. Uh, but if you consider uh, with autonomy, uh, autonomy, then an autonomous uh, power unit, uh, should it be considered as a tractor or as um, a machine? So in this case, which regulation would be the most appropriate? According to the discussions we had actually so far uh, at European level, um, and even if it's still uh, not really clear, uh, we could consider that an existing tractor, uh, which could have uh, uh, some kind of autonomy, could be considered as an, an autonomous uh, tractor. But and in this case, we have for agricultural tractors a specific regulation. So uh, you have the, the figure uh, the, uh, of this uh, regulation. It's regulation 167 to 13. 
It deals with occupational safety, road safety, and um, in particular, the validation must be done by an external um, technical service and uh, granted by uh, an authority. Um, Um, during uh, last year, there was an assessment actually on this specific regulation uh, in order to um, assess how autonomous tractors should be considered if there was a need to uh, open the discussions about uh, this aspect. And um, the recommendation which was provided by the consultant uh, through this assessment was that uh, there should be an independent regulation. So it would be a long-term um, solution because creating a new regulation will take several years. It would need an assessment at European level, uh, ensure that there is an, an interest to, uh, for this uh, subject, and then several discussions between uh, member states, so authorities, and also stakeholders like, uh, like CIMA. Uh, in any case, we consider that at the present time, we have one uh, standard, it's an ISO standard, which deals with um, autonomous functions, and uh, we need to ensure some consistency between tractors and machinery. So the, st the ISO standard is ISO 18497. It was published in 2018, and it gives some principles for design. They are general principles. For a short-term solution, uh, still there is in this regulation on um, agricultural tractors one article which is uh, dedicated to uh, uh, new technologies or new concepts and which would allow actually at the present time uh, to have um, to, to get uh, an approval uh, for an autonomous uh, tractor but it would require uh, first a provisional European type approval um, granted by the authority of one country, then the tractors could be only used in a specific country, and there should be then a request uh, to the European Commission to, um, to have the validation to have it uh, accessible to any country of the European Union. So it means, and the intent of this uh, request would be to push then the European Commission to open some discussions about this new technology and to assess whether there would be a need to, um, to include this new technology in this specific regulation. Then we come to machinery. So machinery is, um, let's say, a motorized uh, equipment which is fitted with a specific tool, and with this specific tool, your equipment will carry out a specific task, more or less. Um, and it would be also these equipment which are fitted on, uh, on a tractor, so it can be a mounted equipment or trailed equipment. Here, the, so machinery at the present time are covered by um, uh, what is called the Machinery Directive, so it's Directive 20642. Uh, this directive covers only occupational safety, so uh, work um, safety in the working conditions. And uh, the, um, uh, the principle of the, the conformity assessment is a self-compliance, which means that um, the manufacturer will prepare um, a technical file where he will um, uh, prepare his risk assessment, uh, identify the technical solutions uh, next to all the um, uh, hazards he has ident identified on his machine, um, so that in case of accident, there could be um, uh, a clear process of what was done on his machine, uh, to, to reduce the risks and uh, make his machine safe. Um, 
So compared to the regulation on tractors, this is one big difference. The conformity assessment for tractors is done by an external um, uh, operator. And um, as the machinery directive is, a very, is covering a very wide range of, uh, of machines, so it could be chainsaws to uh, combine harvesters, so a very wide variety of machines. Then we have very, um, very general requirements. These are called essential health and safety requirements. And the, the, the uh, machinery directive actually was developed to promote then specific texts uh, which are not mandatory, so they, are, they are called harmonized standards, so we could have uh, European standards in any case. Um, uh, the, the reference I gave previously for, uh, for autonomous uh, functions, uh, ISO 18497, is an example. EN ISO um, 18497 from 2018 is a standard which, which complies with the machinery directive. And um, uh, having these um, harmonized standards um, is one way to uh, to show that you can comply with the machinery directive. It's, uh, it's one way, it's not mandatory, but it's a help, and uh, it tends to give what is called um, uh, the state of the art. So to, to, to ensure that the, the technical content of this harmonized standard is uh, good enough to comply with the machinery uh, directive, you have an assessment by an external consultant, and then the reference of this specific document is uh, referenced in, um, is published, sorry, um, in the official journal of the European Union, and uh, through this publication, uh, the if you comply with this standard, it means it gives you presumption of conformity with the machinery directive, which means the full compliance with the standard for your machines um, gives you the conformity to the machinery directive. This machinery directive, so as you see, it's from 2006, so now it's um, more than 15 years, and uh, there was um, a request actually to revise this directive uh, to take into account new technologies which include uh, autonomous mobile machinery, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, also um, what is called um, internet of things, so the, all the exchange um, of data. So we have, um, this is what, what I mentioned, sorry. Uh, what, what I mentioned, and uh, actually also, uh, together with the revision of this uh, machinery uh, directive, uh, there has been the development of a regulation dedicated to artificial intelligence and uh, for Internet of Things, uh, so cyber security, we have the development at the present time of a uh, regulation uh, on the, which is called the Cyber Resilience Act. So the idea is really to, to ensure that for new technologies, there will be uh, a full set of European regulations uh, which will ensure the safety of the equipment which are uh, on, um, uh, on the market. These, these uh, regulations apply to uh, new equipment uh, and so apply basically to, uh, to the, the machine, and so it's, they, they give the requirements to be applied by the manufacturers. For, um, for this uh, machinery regulation, because we are moving from a directive to a regulation, uh, and in practice, once a regulation is published, it has to be applied in any country of the European Union. We, we, um, the publication of this regulation is expected within a few weeks, actually. Uh, so this is why I put already the, the year. I don't have 
the, the number afterwards. But um, uh, so the publication is expected for, uh, let's say, around May or June of this year. And uh, we, we expect that the application uh, will start by the end of 2026 or beginning of 2027. In this machinery regulation, uh, they are providing some um, aspects to be considered, uh, especially for, uh, let's say, high-risk machinery. I know the wording is not really uh, the proper one, but uh, a machine which would be considered as a more dangerous. Uh, and um, the criteria which are put forward uh, to, to make the risk assessment uh, on uh, uh, to identify these machines are the occurrence of, uh, of hazards, the severity of hazards, the frequency and the avoidance. So the difference between the occurrence and the frequency is that the occurrence is uh, the probability that uh, one risk may happen and uh, once it happens would it frequently occur or not? And uh, the main principles for, for the safety uh, to be taken into account um, are described then uh, through an iterative approach. Uh, so the first, uh, the first step is to take some design measures to, so to, to avoid to have this, uh, this risk. Then if it's not possible to avoid by design, to, to provide the protection, and um, as a third uh, step, so it means it would be it would keep a risk, and then it would be it would be called a residual risk. Then it would be to uh, give a warning um, on the machine itself and to uh, provide enough instruction to inform uh, the operator of this residual risk. So I try to put a bit forward the main aspects uh, of this new machinery regulation, which will uh, cover um, uh, robots and which is um, referred as uh, autonomous mobile machinery in, in the regulation. So of course, um, I mentioned robots in agriculture, but in our, because it's our case, but uh, as I mentioned a bit earlier, the machinery regulation covers all kinds of machinery. So um, um, the, the main aspects which will uh, be uh, added compared to the existing um, uh, directive are um, for uh, in um, considering ergonomics, the interface between the human and the machinery, uh, the fact that the control system must perform the safety functions by itself, um, also, it introduces uh, a, new, um, a new function. Uh, so uh, it, it introduces um, the role of supervisor and a supervisor function. This, this is a function where you have a remote surveillance of uh, the autonomous machinery and it gives some limited order. This uh, supervisory function applies, uh, is active only in autonomous mode. Uh, the good point for, for manufacturer is that it's not imposed on all kinds of machinery. There were many discussions about uh, this aspect. And so it means we have to consider the, the environment and the, the, criteria, the technical criteria of your machine to assess whether you need or not um, uh, a supervisor and the, then a supervisory function. As I mentioned, it must provide information and overview of the operation to the supervisor. It must allow the machine to stop uh, or to start but only in autonomous mode or bring at least um, in, a, in a safe position or a safe state. It must alert also of the dangerous situations. And um, of course, if this um, uh, supervisory function 
it has to be important on the machine itself, uh, then the machine cannot operate if it's not active. The machinery regulation provides also some, um, some specifications on the autonomous operating area. So there are, let's say, two main uh, considerations. Either uh, you have a peripheral protection system uh, around your, your uh, working area. Um, and if you do not have, you will need to have a, a need of a detection of obstacle of persons. Uh, but in the case you have a, uh, let's say an enclosure of your environment, you may also need uh, to have uh, a detection of uh, these uh, objects or persons. So it's really an assessment of the environment and the conditions of work uh, in which your, your robot will work. We need also to take into account all the risks which are related to the movement of your machines in this operating area. And uh, uh, also, um, uh, if your machine is connected with some other trailers or combined with another machine, you have to consider the whole combination and to assess whether it would uh, generate uh, additional risks. A failure of the steering system of your, of your uh, equipment uh, mustn't have any impact on safety. So in case of failure, you have to ensure that it, it, it gets in some kind, in some um, uh, safe state. And uh, also in the case you have some batteries on your, uh, on your equipment and you need to, to, to have it recharge, the movement to the charging station uh, must, be, must be safe. As I mentioned a bit earlier, um, uh, so in new technologies, we have AI. Uh, originally, uh, when the regulation dealing with, uh, with the machine, with machinery was, um, was, was uh, developed, um, there was intent also to, to have in parallel one regulation dedicated to AI. And so there was a very close link between both regulations. Uh, considering uh, the heavy work which was done on the uh, high, high regulation, uh, it was not possible to have a, a, a parallel development, and so they decided to, um, to disconnect actually both regulations. And so any reference in the machinery regulation specifically to AI was removed, and uh, then they tried to find some kind of wording to, uh, to target more specifically what is mentioned as a system with fully or partially self-evolving behavior using machine learning approaches. So what we want to have, what we have in mind are these uh, equipment which will have, which will use machine learning te techniques and which will be um, updated online. And um, so in this case, uh, in particular when, uh, so this system of uh, machine learning ensures the safety function, there will be, uh, there is a specific consideration because um, we, we feel that um, this machine may be very, uh, um, has a higher uh, level of risk compared to a usual uh, machine, and then it would be considered, it would be, uh, it has to be validated by a third party in this case. Even if it's present in the machinery regulation, this is a specific case where you would need to have a validation by a third party. So it would concern, concern uh, this equipment uh, which are placed uh, so these uh, uh, machine learning uh, systems which are placed independently on the market or when they are embedded in a, in a machinery. And uh, the, the system itself uh, had not been previously placed on the market. 
I hope I'm clear mentioning that. Then there is still, I mentioned this connection between the machinery regulation and the AI regulation. Um, but uh, in the, the specific case, as it is, to, it is validated by a third party for the machinery regulation, it would need to comply with additional uh, technical requirements, which are then given also in the, which are given in the AI regulation. So in practice, for these specific items, you would need to comply both with the technical requirements of the machinery regulation and also on the AI regulation uh, because they would be considered high-risk AI. And then the harmonized standards I referred uh, for um, uh, a specific uh, use case of the machinery regulation. So, for example, uh, let's say uh, cell working machinery. Uh, if it includes um, uh, a machine learning uh, with a self evolving uh, uh, system, then um, it would be. Uh, it, um, I managed to lose myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> In this application, it would have to comply first uh, with the machinery regulation, but also with the additional uh, uh, technical requirements of the AI regulation, sorry. So for um, this specific uh, self-evolving behavior uh, systems, uh, the, the, the technical requirements which are headed in, uh, in the machinery regulation uh, are mostly related to uh, control systems. Uh, so uh, no modifications are allowed uh, if it would generate some uh, other situation. Uh, the, the actions cannot, um, of the tasks, of the defined tasks, so compared to the original uh, risk assessment of the, of the equipment, cannot be further for the, the task and the movement. Uh, and in particular, there is really a need uh, to record any intervention uh, to, to ensure that in case uh, you have such systems in your machine, and if there is something wrong, so you have some, some clues about what happened and which uh, intervention or which update of a software generated actually this, uh, this, this change and this hazardous change. So I mentioned for AI, the AI regulation, and uh, in our case, what is really the most important is what I mentioned as high risk AI. And so I give you a few, a few slides also on uh, uh, the development of this AI regulation. So um, as I mentioned a bit previously, uh, it was um, developed in parallel with the machinery regulation. There was a proposal um, emitted in 2021, so two years ago. Um, then it describes, um, it gives an identification of high-risk AI, which depends on the environment. The AI systems ensuring safety functions embedded in uh, tractors will be uh, further uh, uh, evaluated, actually. Uh, so really, this is where we see some difference between machinery and tractors. And the publication of this AI regulation is expected at earliest by the end of this year, but um, I, I was thinking that it will be in the beginning of, uh, of next year. The 
this um, this uh, AI regulation actually gives uh, it considers a risk management systems and it's over the entire life life cycle of the of the machine. So it's not only when uh, the the machine or the the system is is developed and before it is placed on the market. It's also when it is used uh, that there are some regular updates uh, to, to ensure actually it really still uh, is in line with uh, what is required in the regulation. There are some requirements for the for the data and the data governance, uh, which means that um, when you need some data. Uh, for your system, you will need to 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 use several uh, data kind of data sets. So it's training data sets, validation data sets, and one last uh, the last one, which is testing data sets. All of them are independent, and uh, so it shows the, the level of uh, validation you need to to follow. Then there are some, uh, I would say. Um, with an obvious item, but uh, uh, in any case, it needs to be uh, to be reported. But uh, the transparency, which is the behavior of the systems, which can be easily interpretable, um, the the good oversight by humans during the operation of the system, and the cyber resilience. Also, there is a, um, there is one requirement. On the capability of the system to to, to record um, the event during the operation, and then uh, because the title of uh, of the presentation was safety and integrity, and uh, as far as I understand, I would say the word integrity is really related to uh, cyber security, and cyber security or cyber resilience. Um, is described in all the, the first two regulations I, I, gave, I mentioned to you. Um, in the machinery regulation, cyber sec security is mostly uh, considered as um, avoiding that an external uh, the, that an external uh, corruption. Uh, generate hazardous situation on your machinery, so it are really relating to safety. Uh, for the AI regulation, it's uh, in relation with the behavior of your uh, of your system, so ensuring that uh, your your behavior uh, is not modified uh, by external um, uh, corruption. And. Um, uh, the last one, so please, I do apologize for so many regulations, but uh, the, the last one is uh, called uh, the Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, this Cyber Resilience Act actually covers both tractors and machinery, and um, uh, it uses the wording products with digital uh, elements so it could be uh, software and hardware products with uh, its remote. It's some kind of cyber security. Uh, <laughs> who did that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, I tried to explain what is called uh, product with digital elements. Um, in this case, the conformity assessment uh, is uh, ensured through, through a self-compliance, and so the principle will be similar to the machinery regulation, which means you, we have general um, technical requirements, and then for each family of products, uh, you will have the possibility to define um, to, to develop in uh, a standard uh, for a family of products uh, more specific uh, technical requirements.
So the main uh, requirements which are given in this regulation uh, are um, uh, ensure you have an appropriate level of cyber security, which is based on the risk. Uh, your equipment should not, your product should not have any uh, known exploitable uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and then you need to, put, to, to, to protect against unauthorized access to protect your, your data. Uh, and you, have, you need also to record and monitor actually any uh, internal activity. Through, uh, if you identify on your machine some vulnerabilities after it's been placed on the market, then uh, you will need to address these vulnerabilities afterwards through updates to, to your equipment. So on our, on our side, actually, this Cyber Resilience Act um, is not only providing few, few components and then you, your, 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 your machine or your equipment would be uh, fully compliant with, with the regulation. We fear that actually uh, we would have to review completely the whole architecture. And therefore, the, the date of application, which is at the present time 226 for this, uh, uh, for this regulation, may not or will not be, be enough. So we would have to, to, to push till uh, 230. Uh, for us, it sounds much more reasonable uh, for our sector. And on the other side, for tractors, there is a fear to have uh, another regulation to comply with. So um, uh, again, a multiplication of regulations, uh, which um, would uh, generate a big burden on, uh, on the shoulders of manufacturers. So it's been, um, I've tried to describe actually the regulatory uh, world uh, and uh, the, the European re rules uh, which will uh, have to be uh, satisfied by manufacturers. And uh, as I mentioned also, we have some, um, these regulations, so the Machinery Regulation and the Cyber Resilience Act, uh, try to push uh, and to promote the use of harmonized standards. So these standards are really dedicated, they can be really dedicated to agricultural, to agricultural machinery. And um, so um, here are a few slides about uh, what we have at the present time uh, in standardization. And in particular, we have, I already mentioned it for, uh, for tractors, but this is really a standard which gives presumption of conformity to the existing uh, machinery directive. It's ISO 18497. It gives a principle of design for agricultural machinery. Um, and when it was developed, actually, it was mostly uh, focused on these uh, larger size uh, machinery, so small machines are not very well taken into account. Um, and so there was, um, th there was a, um, a wish expressed to uh, review uh, this standard and to have a better, a better coverage uh, of, uh, of, the tech, uh, of the machines um, and to uh, cover also all kind of uh, automation of autonomy. And it was developed under uh, taking into account the kind of techniques you have. Well, yes, we can see properly here. Uh, you have so the kind of techniques, uh, non-automated, automated, the kind of uh, modes, and have you ha and then you have all these uh, functions. So manual, non-automated, partially automated, semi-autonomous, autonomous. Um, there was uh, uh, so a revision has been initiated on this ISO standard. Now it's split in four different parts, uh, with the definition of vocabularies. So the development of uh, these notions of um, semi-autonomous, autonomous, and so on. And uh, so the four parts 
Uh, the first one is dealing with the design principles and vo vocabulary. The second one is uh, dealing with the obstacle protection systems. Third one with uh, autonomous operating zones. And the last one is uh, dealing with uh, verification and the validation principles. So um, these standards overall uh, are giving some criteria uh, for a manufacturer who wants to uh, to um, uh, to, uh, uh, to, de to design a, a safe uh, a safe robot. There are general requirements. They do not take into account the um, uh, the specific application of the machine. But uh, it gives actually the main guidelines to follow uh, and uh, the points to be taken into account when he, he carries out the risk assessment. And in particular, for the validation and the verification, there are some, uh, some description of possible uh, test methods and to be considered depending on the, on the size of your machine, for example, for the detection of an object or a person, uh, there are uh, several uh, methods uh, and uh, criteria for, for an object uh, to, to help the, the manufacturer. So now on our side, we... Now we have the general um, uh, requirements which are uh, uh, under development. Uh, we want to, uh, to uh, develop specific uh, use cases, um, uh, technical requirements. Uh, so it's a preliminary work we are doing in our organization. Uh, we decided also to work together uh, with uh, uh, US and uh, a Japan organization to ensure we have worldwide technical requirements. The intent is to comply with the new machinery regulation. And um, so we identified uh, some priorities in our work. So it's really um, the first uh, work we want to do is uh, soil working um, operations. Uh, as you will see uh, in in the tomorrow and um, uh, and uh, Thursday, uh, these are the most uh, used uh, cases, and uh, also we would like to to work on crop protection actually in the following months. Uh, what we uh, we work as a on, at the present time, we are working actually on the risk assessment. Uh, we really thought uh, it was uh, the important starting point. We see many, for example, test developments at the present time, but what is important first is to really to assess what is significant as, as a hazard and uh, the risk related to, to a machine. So we need to take into account, of course, the technical criteria. The, the environment where your machine is working. And um, uh, we need to have all these aspects taken into account before we can provide and prepare some technical solutions. So I said it almost completely. And uh, so the intent is to, as I mentioned, it's uh, some kind of worldwide work we want to have. So the intent is to propose some, uh, to have some proposals uh, to ISO. Uh, our timeline for our internal work is to, to be able to, uh, to have uh, something finalized by, uh, by the end of this year, as, at least for soil working. And uh, for cybersecurity, same, uh, same situation, uh, harmonized standards to answer to, the, um, to comply with the Cyber Resilience Act. 
So there is uh, CIMA is working closely with uh, uh, another organization, with, which is the Agricultural Industry Electronics Foundation. So we are really focusing on electricity, electric, and uh, electronic uh, aspects. So um, there is a preliminary work which is done in this organization, and then it will be uh, pushed uh, to, to ISO. So I think that's it. And a few words also to, to, to mention. Indirectly, it's linked also to, uh, to, uh, to uh, safety, but uh, uh, CIMA is also involved in a, in a European project, which is agrobofood. So it's not uh, only a manufacturer. There are also um, uh, test labs, many uh, stakeholders which are involved in this in this project. The intent is to set uh, uh, a network to, to promote the technical solutions uh, which are developed on this, uh, on this equipment. Um, so you have some uh, digital innovation hubs uh, and um, our, um, our manufacturers are represented also in this, uh, in this network. Uh, what is important, and uh, I forgot to mention it uh, actually for CIMA, is that we are, uh, we are uh, defending the interest of big companies, but not only. We are also uh, working with, uh, with SMEs, and uh, in particular with, um, in the field of uh, autonomous uh, machine, um, SMEs are really present. So as I mentioned, the intent is, uh, is really to, to promote some mature uh, technologies and to ensure a network um, and uh, for the technical solutions. A catalog has been developed actually by, uh, uh, by this, uh, uh, for this project. Uh, so far, there are uh, 123 uh, robot solutions and still uh, people can apply for to have their solutions uh, covered and um, uh, mentioned in this catalog. So in case you are interested, uh, I think in, you, in any case the presentation will be <laughs> available. So you have the contact of AgroboFood and also of my uh, colleague who is following uh, all this uh, project is uh, Vanya Bizevach. And uh, thank you a lot. I hope my uh, presentation was not too harsh and too theoretical. And if you have uh, any questions, uh, they are welcome. Thank you very much. Hopefully there will be um, a presentation about the AgroboFood uh, project uh, a little bit later in the afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, we are <laughs> a bit uh, out of time, but you uh, stay uh, here for the discussion, so maybe we can uh, go further on some points during the discussions. And you are here also tomorrow, and uh, you stay tomorrow? I will be here tomorrow. So you will be free to uh, ask questions uh, to Christophe tomorrow. Thank you again. And so uh, we will switch on uh, a talk from uh, Dimia Iberaken, uh, who will uh, talk uh, about a comparative study of leader technology for 3D mapping in agricultural environment to enhance safety. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dimi Amiraken, I'm a research engineer at INRAE. And this is Marc-Antoine Moland, who is a project manager in computer vision in, uh, at Inodura. Uh, here to present a comparative study of LiDAR technologies for uh, multiple application in agricultural environment to enhance safety. So I'll start by explaining uh, uh, the research team where I uh, belong. 
So it's called Romea. It's a robotics uh, research team that is based at Clermont-Ferrand. And we perform research for the autonomy of robots, of robots evolving in natural environments for agriculture. So the scope of uh, uh, the research subjects that uh, we have at Romea goes from uh, the conception of the robots till uh, handling the interaction with the humans uh, and the environment. Hello, everybody. So I'm Marc Antoine from uh, Ainojoa. Um, Ainojoa is a tech company based in uh, Lyon, and we are designing and uh, manufacturing custom systems for a wide range uh, uh, of uh, applications. Uh, our skills are software, vision, robotics, signal processing, artificial intelligence, and uh, embedded systems. And we are developing four technologies. Uh, so we have Inopic, which is a robot guiding system uh, for bin picking application and flexible applications. Uh, we are developing Inovia, which is uh, an embedded system that can detect people uh, around moving machines uh, in order to avoid collisions. So this uh, uh, is in a demo uh, from uh, Inrae uh, robot. And we are also uh, uh, building Inoscan and Inoslam, but we will talk about that further in the presentation. Okay, so together we, uh, we created a joint laboratory called Agrivia, who will be starting work uh, starting from the 1st April, and I will come back to it later a bit. So if uh, we have to put the context, so agricultural robotics is identified as one of the pillars of the third agricultural revolution by the Ministry of the French Ministry of Agriculture because it holds great promises in meeting the future challenges, especially for the ecological transition. But these robots have to be able to handle several kinds of behaviors in order to act on the crop and on the land, while being able to guarantee safety, safety of navigation by preserving the accuracy and integrity of navigation, even in harsh environment, but also, and more, impo and more importantly, the safety of, um, of uh, humans and the safety of infrastructure. And this implies a good knowledge of the environment. So uh, the researchers and industries usually use uh, many sensors, cameras, GPS, or LIDARs. Each one of them have advantages and limitations. And in this work, we uh, wanted to use LIDARs for their ability to produce depth information and high pre precision of measurement, but more importantly, because they are insens insensitive to light, uh, to light. So while using this LIDAR, we wanted to address uh, two limitations. The first limitation is related to the laser safety uh, sensors. So the, most ma the majority of these uh, laser safety sensors gives a measure of distance, which in some cases triggers unnecessary stops because it's not able to differentiate between obstacles uh, that are dangerous, like people or infrastructure, and traversable objects, which are, for example, tree branches or high grass. Uh, for this reason, uh, we wanted to investigate the generation of 3D maps of the environment using LIDARs in order to have more details about the, what, uh, what is surrounding our robots. The second limitation is related to the GPS-based navigation in agricultural environment. Indeed, GPS relies on satellite signals, and in some cases, we lose the precision uh, of the Ertika signals in some parts of the environment, like forested areas. And because we need a uh, localization all the time when uh, having uh, to navigate using uh, GPS, we need to think of alternatives. In this case, we investigate a SLAM that is, uh, as a first step, purely LIDAR. And you will see it later uh, in this presentation. So for these uh, uh, two applications, we wanted to see uh, how well uh, the LIDAR technology works, but also compare the different, techno different LiDAR technologies uh, regarding these applications. So first, to clarify uh, the, what follows, I will explain a bit the experimental test, test bed and the use sensors. So the experimental test bed, uh, we, we perform all these uh, experiments using uh, 
uh, robot, a Sabiagri robot, which is an electrical and automati automatized tractor that uh, where we can uh, uh, lift uh, an embedded tool uh, behind, but also sensors in front. At least the, that, that's how we do it. And uh, you will see during this presentation many setups, uh, experimental setups. The first one is indoor for the 3D mapping to see how well we can 3D map an indoor environment. And of course, outdoor uh, for the mapping of the slam, where you can see buildings, trees, uh, prototype of a Christian child, which is the green element, and sometimes humans. So the sensors that we use are uh, basically all from SIG for uh, their robustness and the uh, quality of signals. Uh, the differences between them relies in the number of layers, the frequency, the working range. So we tried uh, to pick one layer, uh, uh, that uh, two layers with one layer, one layer with four layers, and another one with 24 layers. But you can see that the uh, other characteristics are different. Uh, this table will come back a lot later when we will be analyzing the results of the 3D mapping, etc. Okay, so to start, we will uh, talk about the InnoScan for 3D mapping, and I'll leave Marc Antoine explain it. Uh, so, as uh, uh, we mentioned, so we have a limited uh, number of uh, layers uh, on the LiDAR. Uh, so, from 1 to 24 uh, for this uh, test bench. Um, so, Inodura. Uh, design uh, InnoScan uh, in order to increase uh, this number of layers. Um, so, yeah, a LiDAR complexity and price increases with the number of layers. So, we designed a solution that uh, mechanically rotates the LiDAR in order to virtually obtain uh, an uh, infinity of uh, layers. Uh, we have a rotation motor uh, that gives uh, an absolute angle feedback uh, that is used to recompose uh, really dense point clouds uh, while rotating the LiDAR. And uh, the rotation speed can be adjusted, uh, leading to a lower or higher resolution. So, um, we worked with uh, INRAE uh, in order to, to develop a cr cross-platform uh, which is compatible with uh, different LIDARs uh, and a custom interface with uh, uh, INRAE software in uh, ROS. So you can see here uh, the four different point clouds uh, we have. Uh, in uh, in Rai uh, Hall. Uh, so we see obviously that the number of points increases uh, with the number of layers, the frequency, and the resolutions. For an example, the team 151 has uh, 500,000 points, and uh, the MRS 6000 has more than 3 million points. So we see here that uh, point clouds are really, really dense. Uh, we have uh, really, really good results with uh, the team, which is a really, really small and affordable uh, sensor. And uh, the MRS uh, 1000 is a really good compromise between uh, quality and density of the point clouds so that we take this sensor as a reference for the rest of the presentation. Um, one other thing we noticed is that the MRS 6000 point clouds look a little bit bushy, and that can explain also some uh, other results we have. We uh, have, have also done uh, tests outside, and you see here that uh, LIDAR, is, in LIDAR is a major advantage that it works outdoor. Uh, with uh, no interference caused by uh, sunlight. Okay, so we wanted to go further on the comparison, and as uh, Marc-Antoine said, we took uh, the MRS-1000 as a, as a reference. Uh, 
uh, in order to perform cloud-to-cloud -cloud, uh, comparison and cloud-to-cloud -cloud, uh, distance computation using uh, cloud compare software, if it's familiar for you. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a basic algorithm that uh, looks for, uh, in, in the compared cloud re regarding one point, it looks for its, uh, uh, the most closest one in the reference cloud, and then it, cal it computes the distances. The goal will be to show the disparities between the compared cloud and the reference cloud. And this is what you will see in, the, in this video. So uh, this one is the reference cloud, which is the MRS 1000. And these disparities of uh, the comparison are shown here. We intentionally moved the human that is standing in order uh, to uh, confirm uh, that uh, uh, disparities are well shown. So um, the RGB color uh, are the disparities. So are all the differences that uh, are shown from uh, compared to the reference cloud. So here we are comparing with the 24 layers. So the first, like the conclusion that we had regarding this comparison is that the uh, working range of the MRS 6000, so the 24 layers, allow that to reconstruct the farthest building with the same resolution as the elements in a uh, closed area, as you can see it uh, behind. But also, uh, the disparities that are noticed, especially on the wall uh, of the MRS uh, 6 7 cloud, the 24 layers, are due to the quantization effect, which is the discretization. And this is particularly visible on this sensor because of its distance resolution, which is six centimeters uh, around, uh, which is, uh, this resolution stays uh, constant whether we are close or far. Uh, we can say that uh, this sensor is very suitable when uh, willing to uh, detect something that is very far away. So we did the same thing with the, uh, when comparing the MRS 1000, which is the four layers, with the one layer. And you can see that we have less data uh, on this scan because there we have less layers uh, on the vertical range, so when doing the rotation. However, we can see more details in the horizontal range because in this case we have a better remission. Remission is the measurement of light that we capture uh, from elements. So in here, the LMS 121 has better remission for objects that are, uh, uh, that lights at 90%. Uh, that explains why we, see, why we see more elements that are in RGB color from far. Uh, the other operation mode of the NSCAN is with the angle holding. So we receive a request through uh, ROS services, and we can hold the angle at a certain position in order to perform other tasks. These other tasks can be uh, following of a path. And if you want to know more about this uh, application, you can come tomorrow to the demonstration session uh, in booth E1. But the one that we are interested in in this presentation is the SLAM, a leader-based SLAM where when holding the angle, we can perform SLAM, and I will leave again Marc Antoine explain it. Thank you, Dimia. So SLAM is the acronym of uh, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. Uh, it's one of the key technologies uh, for autonomous robotics. Uh, thanks to SLAM, a robot is able to explore an unknown and complex environment and navigate uh, autonomously. Uh, so, Inodura has been uh, involved in a French government program for three years uh, that aimed to apply uh, SLAM techniques uh, to a wide range, uh, a variety of conditions and uh, situations. Uh, we ended with uh, this jacket uh, that someone uh, can wear and uh, that is uh, um, doing a real-time uh, SLAM. Um, pure LiDAR-based uh, SLAM that we uh, are talking here uh, involves analyzing 3 d pan clouds and searching for characteristic features like uh, edges, planes, and blobs. Uh, and those features have to be compared to previous scans in order to estimate uh, the new six degrees of freedom pose. Uh, 
Uh, and what is really interesting is that a global map uh, can be dynamically um, estimated and uh, it has to be filtered uh, in real time uh, for computation uh, problems. And SLAM can be, uh, of course, robustified with uh, a sense of fusion, uh, like uh, camera, IMU, and uh, odometry. Uh, so we applied uh, pure uh, SLAM, LiDAR SLAM, uh, on uh, data uh, collected by uh, INRAE. Uh, so you see here uh, the construction of the map in uh, real time while the robot is moving. So this is constructed just thanks to the LiDAR. Uh, it's uh, MRS-1000. So, um, we also have a GNSS system on the robot and we compared uh, the tra trajectories. Uh, so, the pure SLAM tra trajectory compared to uh, the GNSS and we see that it's uh, really accurate. Uh, we only have uh, a deviation at the end of the course after a sharp, ter sharp turn. Uh, but with sensor fusion, uh, like uh, adding an uh, IMU, uh, we could uh, reduce this kind of uh, problems. We also did the same test with uh, AMR S6000, and you see here that the result is uh, not that good. Um, so we can uh, observe that the SLAM diverges right after the beginning of the test. Uh, the problem we, we think is uh, the short limiting, limiting angle uh, that limits the number of features uh, we can have. Uh, and we have to remember that the SLAM positioning is not absolute and uh, it can lead to uh, major error propagations. Okay, now that uh, we um, presented the preliminary result about uh, this work, uh, the short-term perspective will be to continue on this comparison, but for other applications like road tracking or spraying, uh, which in this case is working only with the LMS 121, which is the first layer. The other short-term perspective will be to perform data fusion in order to see uh, the improvement of the SLAM application. Uh, especially uh, for uh, the MRS 6000 because the MRS mill is already good. <laughs> uh, uh, also, we want to see how we can uh, perform object identification and human detection with the 3D point cloud that we have from InnoScan, which, which we started doing a bit uh, with the online reconstruction map in order to clusterize and segment uh, the rows and the objects. And the long-term perspective will be the joint laboratory Agrivia. And Agrivia will be focused on developing a safe and certified perception system for autonomous navigation in agriculture that it will be focused on human detection. So if you want to know more about this, you can meet us in the poster session for discussing it uh, a bit with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you that, but uh, we are uh, drifting about the time. Yes. But the good uh, news is that uh, you are uh, making demonstration tomorrow. So yes. uh, you and you have also present on the poster session. So feel free to ask some questions to Marc Antoine and Dimia during the poster presentation and uh, tomorrow and the day after uh, in the demonstration yes. area. Yes. So thank you so much.
And so now we switch uh, to a presentation. We talk about uh, safety, uh, about the robot, but we let's talk about safety uh, for the farmers and uh, with the development of robots that helps farmers to uh, limit the expositions to uh, chemical products. With Felipe uh, from uh, Insect Tech, we talked about uh, the oh. it's scorpion. scorpion project. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I have made a, a bit difference on the title of the presentation, but uh, I will start and you will understand why the title has changed a, a bit. So before I start and speaking about the project Scorpion, uh, I must talk about my institution and what we are, we are doing and um, for your understanding what we are and what we are com uh, contributing for uh, the agriculture sector. So, Inestec, in brief, is a private non-profit R&D organization. So we do research from uh, uh, very basic uh, research, uh, 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 fundamental uh, research uh, projects till uh, uh, high-hand uh, uh, projects. But let's to show you what we do in concrete. So we do everything that is related to ICT and robotics and artificial intelligence. So we have one in one side the people and researchers trying to pull uh, or to push uh, our ideas to the market and we have the other perspective that is uh, initiatives that we have at Inestec that tries to go to the market and understand what are the real needs and desires of the, the society in terms of ICT and robotics. So and then here we have these initi initiatives that we call a tech for something. And uh, the first one that is aligned to my presentation for today is the initiative tech for agrofood, where we try to understand what the agriculture and the food systems needs to be more efficient and more innovative in our world and to be more sustainable. Taking this in mind, so we have this mission that is co-shaping the digital revolution in agrofood food and forestry. And this is uh, uh, pictures from our fields where, with our technology being tested in real environments and real, uh, uh, in real uh, conditions. So we have this catalog of competences. Since we are a private non-profit uh, organization, we don't sell products, neither service, or uh, at least uh, we don't sell service that competes with companies. So what we have uh, capacity is to do anything that is related to robotics, automation, artificial intelligence, IoT technology, and smart photonics that can improve the, the, this ecosystem. To develop these technologies, we have four laboratories that are aligned to this initiative. One of them is the laboratory that I am managing, that is laboratory for robotics and IoT for precision, uh, precision farming, and uh, forestry. Okay. Uh, on this laboratory, we, this was born in 2014, we have looked for the Portuguese reality that is very diverse from the north to the south, okay? And we have looked for the strategic agenda for Europe in terms of robotics. So we have looked for these two realities. Besides that, we have looked for what is the concept of precision agriculture, that is to apply the right product in the right time, in the right condition, in the right place in the farm. And we also have looked for the main manufacturers of uh, machinery for agriculture. And we have identified that there is a lot of big machinery that being produced to put seeds of grams on the, on the soil, on the, on the crops. And this sometimes brings a problem, that is the soil compactation. So uh, we need to think about other solutions besides to bring big machines and try to bring smaller machines to do similar operations. And so this is our mission, to develop small and safe machinery that can operate in these three, three main realities that is very relevant for Portugal, but also for Europe. And when these three realities are steep slope vineyards where we produce the port wine that is well famous world, world, worldwide. And uh, what we have two main, uh, main challenges that is these vineyards, they are not in flat terrains, they are in steep slopes, and where the GNS or GPS may fail because the signals might be blocked, but also we have a challenge that is the terrain is not flat and the, the robots might fall or the machinery might fall. And there is some constri constraints in terms of mechanization. Uh, 
Uh, another reality is the green, uh, green, green houses that we have a lot of in the north of Portugal, but also the forestry. In the forest, we have a, a strong need to have machines that can go to the forestry and collect this biomass. These are very relevant for our perspective because we can combine the three realities in terms of efficiency. We are not just looking for in robotics in a particular condition, but we are looking in more complex systems that doesn't not require just robotics, but also complex systems that can cooperate between forestries, vineyards, and greenhouses, okay? Of course, we have a lot of experience de developing robots, but with this experience we have learned a lot to developing IoT technologies that can be applied in this reality. So this is our roadmap in terms of uh, ro uh, uh, developing technologies. So we have in the, uh, four milestones through our, our laboratories. In the first milestone we have defined that we want robots that can go to these steep slopes uh, uh, and navigate fully autonomous and acquire the maximum information from the crop. And then we, have, we are at the moment in the second stage that is precision spraying robotics technologies. Uh, we are also aiming uh, and working at the moment and starting working in pruning and harvesting operations. So this is our um, roadmap of perspective for our laboratory. We have um, these groups of technologies that we are working on it. Uh, we are more or less a, a team of 24 people at the moment. And we work from navigation safety, and the safety, since is the topic of this session, we don't look at the safety just in terms of the sensors, but also in terms of the code that we produce at the laboratories. Most of the days that we produce code, this code will be reused by the companies in the future. And so what we look for the code is like we are doing in the aviation system, that is, the code should, should be readable, understandable, and reusable in the, in the future, and uh, uh, stable, in terms of uh, 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 upgrading. Uh, for testing and validating these technologies, we have five uh, 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 experimental facilities that are supplied by uh, uh, Portuguese companies where we can test and deploy these technologies. This is the first generation of robots that we have deployed in the steep slope vi the vineyard. The first one is a robot that is able to go to the vineyard. This was in the autumn season, but it's a robot that is able with a sensor on the robotic arm to touch uh, on the grape or in the leaf and extract 45 parameters or more on the grape or from the leaf with a high accuracy for understanding how in stress is the plant or in quality state is the plant. This is very relevant. Uh, if you want to make a, uh, a more wise harvesting operation, because you can collect uh, the best grapes on the, on the right moment, okay? And in the second uh, video, is, is not playing, sorry for that, but is a, a robot that is able to make precision spraying to the grapes, okay? Uh, with this experience and with this knowledge, we help help the Portuguese company that has uh, developed the robot that is able to go to these steep slope vineyards. This was done in, uh, in a triangle of innovation that we call in Portugal, that we must have always uh, a research center, uh, end user, and a company that can take the technology to the market. Okay, uh, we have. I will not go too much in detail, but here you can see, see the same technology that is operating in the forestry for doing operations of biomass uh, collection and harvesting. Okay, I will not go too much in detail, otherwise I cannot present the main projects that we have here. One of the things that we have understand on the laboratory is that we, to put this technology in the market, we need to develop not just some parts of the technology. We, can, we need to develop the, te the full technology from scratch because there is some impacts when we develop uh, everything from scratch because the software might be influenced by the mechanical components that we have in the robot. So what we have done here from our ex past experience, uh, we have developed the second version that are a second version of robots that are built from scratch. And the idea here is to help to take this technology more faster to the market. These are the two robots that we have here. You can see uh, tomorrow uh, there are uh, uh, the, these robots operating autonomously out there. Out there. Uh, I will not to show you too much in detail, but these are the same robots 
the, uh, the, the, the new robots operating in the same conditions but with the software that we developed in the first generation. The first one is doing a mowing operations in steep slope vineyards but also in flat vineyards uh, and we have the sprayers uh, robots in, in the other side. I will not go too much in detail to this robot because this will be presented tomorrow and we have some um, demonstrations tomorrow so you can see in, in live. Uh, this is IoT. I will not also talk about uh, IoT because we are in robotics, so uh, in a robotics form, perhaps this is not so much interesting for you, but we have a uh, concept that is to use these IoT technologies that are compatible with the robots, but we can, uh, that we can use in the, in the after, uh, afterwards. So I will not also detail this. So uh, the Scorpion project is a European project funded by USPA uh, agency where we aim to pick uh, the GNSS technology, namely the Galileo signals and uh, new signals, and to put this uh, at the service of the agricultural robots. Okay, This was a project that started in 2021 and will end at the end of this year. Okay. Uh, the idea here is to build a robot that is able to answer the steep slope vineyards uh, requirements. That is, robots that can go to these steep slope vineyards and operate fully autonomously. Okay? This reality is not from Portugal, just the, it's a reality for seven or eight countries in Europe, okay? including Germany, Spain, uh, France, uh, Switzerland and Italy. And uh, when we are solving this problem, we are solving a problem of 10% of area in Europe, okay? This consortium joins uh, research centers like in Eshtec, uh, Eurekat, um, and STEMS, and join two companies, that is Deimos, that is an experienced company doing GNSS receivers, Time that is a, a manufacturer of precision sprayers, and we have associations like uh, Servin, IPN uh, and Inovi, and we have SPI that is helping in the communication and dissemination of the results. We have also Barning, and I forgot to mention that is also from the uh, research uh, side. Okay, I will not go into in details of the work package, but uh, we have uh, on this project we have put a lot of integration operations to show the, our capabilities in terms of consortium. So we are driven by results to have the robots operating uh, on this on this condition. So at this moment, we will make a third integration on this affair. So you will see the robot being integrated with some, some components. It will not be with the, the full functionalities, but we, you will see the robot with very basic functionalities in terms of spraying. Uh, I invite you to join uh, our newsletters that is in this link, so you can subscribe it. And the idea is to, to deploy uh, this robot and these realities in Portugal, Italy, and in Spain. Of course, in Spain we have chosen a small and easy um, vineyard because it was uh, for the first integration. But as you can see, this is not a typical flat vineyard. It's a complex for robotics. Uh, the first robot that uh, we have built was starting for some uh, components that exist in the market. We have picked a tractor uh, that has 75 uh, horse horsepowers and we have put a sprayer on the top and we have integrated the most uh, uh, variable rate technology on this sprayer to make precision spraying in, steep, in, uh, in this case was in a flat vineyard. Uh, I hope that this video is not so long for not, the not disturb. I don't know, uh, well, always my time because I think that we are delaying it a bit. But because I don't see the clock here and I need the clock because sometimes I, I lose my time. So this is the same, this is a machinery that is uh, uh, making a precision spray in, the, in a vineyard, okay? And, um, and what we have uh, shown here is that we, we need to uh, update this machinery if we want to go to steep slope vineyards, okay? That machine before weighs almost 1,600 uh, kilograms, okay? And the challenge is to decrease this to a half of the size, okay? And to be fully um, electrical and with the capacity to work in offset way because in steep slope vineyards you don't have the other side to store or to have the, the wheels uh, to navigate with your robot. So that, this was the first concept. Uh, that is a robot that can operate in these vineyards with an offset and a recovering sprayer, okay? 
and that should weigh less than 60 uh, kilograms, okay? And has a capacity to transport 100 liters for spraying one hectare, okay? Uh, this was the, the first concept we have designed, and we have added a new capability that is not just to transport uh, water to spray with these chemical products, but also the capacity to transport UV lights for novel treatments. UV lights is something that is in the literature being used most of uh, nowadays, and the idea here is to test and validate these concepts together with the chemical products. This is the final. This is the final version. You will see it tomorrow. I will not go too much in detail. It has a capacity to transport uh, 10 kilowatts of batteries, okay, and has six kilowatts of powers in the wheels. Uh, on this product, we are developing a novel receiver that is capable to take the all benefits of the GNS signals that we have available in Europe, okay, and to to tackle this problem, we are developing the SLAM, like the previous colleagues have mentioned, uh, that is to be something redundant and complementary to GNSS solutions. Because if, it, if GPS fails or the GNS fails, we need to have something that can live without the GNS solutions. And so in this project, we are developing two kinds of SLAM systems to be complementary. If one fails, the other can be alive and keep uh, giving the right position of the robot, okay? Uh, I will not go too much in details. If you want, I can explain you uh, or more in detail. Here, it's a benchmark for the state of the art that we exist in the literature. I will not go too in detail, but in this, uh, in this test, we were, we, were to pr we were capable to prove that the, uh, the slum is capable to live uh, for almost 30, uh, 30 minutes uh, on a typical steep slope vineyard, okay, without uh, losing a lot of accuracy. Uh, one of the things that we are also doing is, like I mentioned before, this is not a typical vineyard, okay, and what you see in the, f the first image is what can happen in robots. We have happened that with, the, with our robots in real vineyards, and so what we are doing here is planning a safe trajectory for the robot that the robot will not follow in the vineyard, okay? And so in terms of safety, we don't look just for the localization, but we also look, look this for the, the, the path planning of the system, okay? This is a, a, a real digital model of the vineyard that we are testing these robots, okay? Uh, besides of this, we need also to have systems uh, for the robot to be able to avoid humans, but also animals. You cannot ensure that no animal will emerge on the vineyard, okay? And so um, what we are doing here is to pick the same technology and the same experience for uh, uh, avoiding uh, danger places, okay? Uh, we have done and developed, the, extended the, the, the algorithm to be capable to detect uh, collisions with humans, but also with other obstacles. And what you see here is there is some parts on this kind of vineyards that is not very steep for the robot, but the robot is, is not able to, to overcome it. But in terms of navigation, is an obstacle. And what we are doing here is to have the capability to change the tra trajectory of the robot in a safe way ensuring that the robot can do that without putting the robot in a dangerous situation. So, besides of that, we are also having, this is a mandatory, having cameras on the uh, 30, uh, 600 degrees of vision of the robot, capable of detecting persons, and this, uh, this uh, capability is a capability to detect the human to change the behavior of the robot. And to change the behavior of the robot is to reduce the velocity of the robot, but also to stop the robot if someone emerges in the front of the, of the robot or an animal emerges in the front of the robot, the implement should be stopped to avoid any problem for the animal or for the human. One thing that we have done at our laboratory, since most of these robots use raw operative system, we have developed a tool that is capable to analyze the full code and understand if there is any issue that might uh, create a problem in, in terms of safety in the future of your, uh, your code. Uh, this is for ROJ1. We have not 
uh, upgraded this for the ROS2 version, uh, but our robots are at the moment in ROS2. Uh, since my time is finished, I have one minute, okay? Uh, one thing that we think that is mandatory for robots is to have uh, mission supervision. And what we are doing here is this mission supervision should be compatible with any decision support system. And what we mean with this, this, this um, uh, mission supervision that we are developing in this project is capable to pick in a prescription map that comes from a decision support system and translate this prescription map in a set of uh, tasks that should be accomplished by the robot. And this mission uh, supervision is cap capable to understand if the robot is executing the mission, but also the task according to what was the planet. And so this is one of the outcomes of the project. It will be in an open source way. Uh, we hope to deploy it in the coming six months and be available to the full community. And that's it from my project. We have the demos for tomorrow. I think that I don't took more than 20 minutes. I try to be very fast, so uh, I hope that I have accomplished very, very fast with the time. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry uh, to be uh, a little bit in late and not have the opportunity uh, to ask questions to, uh, to uh, speakers. Uh, but uh, for all the speakers, there will be uh, here tomorrow uh, we, on the demo uh, areas. And then uh, the transition <laughs> about the human detection uh, will be done with uh, Christophe Debain uh, from INRAE who talk about uh, the detection and collision avoidance and the different tests in uh, the framework of the ARPA challenge. Thank you, Roland. Um, so I'm um, Christophe Debain and I work at INRAE in the Romea team which is the robotic uh, team of uh, INRAE, the same that described by uh, Dimia before. So uh, with this presentation, uh, I want to share with you uh, our current work on uh, the latest uh, um, agricultural uh, robot performance assessment protocol, which is a protocol uh, of tests of uh, human detection and uh, collision avoidance in agricultural context. So um, Philippe Héritier is the project manager of uh, this work funded by OECD and INRAE. So, so initially, the um, APA project uh, was funded by uh, Agrobo Food uh, European project, and in um, 2021, we presented at FIRA the first free um, APA test protocol, whose objective uh, was were to test the performance of a mobile robot safety system. In particular, we presented the ARPA-1 uh, protocol, uh, which addresses uh, the evaluation of anti-collision uh, system. This uh, video uh, shows the results of anti-collision uh, system test uh, based on the um, standard ISO uh, 18497 and on um, failure mode cause and effect analysis of this type of functions. So you can see the um, the robot of one of, uh, of our partners, uh, who is uh, VTBot, and uh, the, the obstacle, uh, which is the reference obstacle of, uh, of the standard. And then at the top of the video, you have um, uh, the, uh, the measurement we have done uh, during the test. So we have um, the speed of the machine and the distance between uh, the robot and the obstacle. In um, 2021, we developed another protocol, the second one, whose objective is to assess the performance of a perception system under harsh environment uh, conditions, like rain, fog, or dust. Uh, to do that, we work uh, with another partner, who is uh, CEREMA in Clermont-Ferrand. CEREMA has a structure uh, with um, if we, um, if it can do uh, some uh, rain, fog, and, 
and so uh, harsh um, conditions for, for robots and uh, more for sensor. And we test, uh, you, you, you can see on the video, the, the test with uh, some uh, laser sensor and uh, with uh, some um, rain density and fog density. And in some cases, it's, it's very difficult to, to see the, the obstacle in, in the laser measurements. And the third one, in, uh, in 2021, uh, we developed uh, uh, the last protocol concerning the function of geofencing to guarantee that uh, the robot does not leave uh, the agricultural plot. So to do that, um, we have defined uh, um, a plot uh, very difficult for robots. So you have the, um, uh, the shape of, uh, of the plot, it's like a whale. Uh, with a lot of uh, different angles and, and so on. And uh, the, the robot has to, to work on this, on this plot uh, without leaving it. So here we can see uh, two videos showing the, the test of two robots of, uh, of our partners in this project, so CITIA and, uh, and VTBOT. So it was for uh, 2021 uh, results. Oh, excuse me. Okay. In 2022, we work on a fourth protocol whose objective is to test uh, uh, the performance of uh, human detection and uh, collision avoidance uh, system in a context including uh, agricultural work situations. Let's look at um, some world situations uh, on the ground. This picture represents the work of uh, vine uh, tree slicing, where people collaborate with a machine in order to perform the task. As you can see, uh, it is uh, sometimes uh, very difficult to distinguish workers and vegetation. However, autonomous machines must be able to evolve uh, in the vegetation and detect human uh, being in order to avoid uh, the, the collision. Another situation, uh, here is the case of, um, of a child in a maize crop. In fact, uh, the, the child is it's a little dummy we have in, in, in Rai. Uh, even it's more difficult or quasi impossible for the eye to detect the, uh, the dummy presence. Uh, so autonomous machine uh, will uh, therefore have to be equipped with a very high performance perception uh, system to cover the risk of human collision in, uh, in this agricultural context. So it is some situation that shows that we need uh, to design test protocols allow uh, async performance of, uh, of, this, of this safety system. Our method, uh, so this slide is to, to show some elements of our method uh, to design the protocols. Uh, here with, um, with a failure mode cause and effect analysis, uh, we consider the key factors for testing uh, the operation of an anti-collision system in an agricultural environment. To do that, um, we consider uh, the features of uh, DUMI um, for child and adult with a specific size and uh, body temperature integrations. Uh, one important factor is to vary the position of the DUMI in the field regarding the vegetation. It can be stand also it can be standing or lying down, depending uh, of the situation of uh, work or of, of if uh, person, the human being has some problem. So um, to guarantee um, an objective um, analysis of the results, we need to create artificial environment uh, materializing a core pro. It is, um, it is important because with our test protocol, we want uh, to, be, uh, to have results 
uh, which um, are uh, repeatable, so we can compare uh, a first uh, version of a system to a second one, or we can compare different systems between each other. Uh, in the same idea, a record of hardware and a software version of the robot security system is, uh, is, is a key factor. So, um, our proposal for, for this uh, fourth protocol. So, we decide to use a uh, heated child and adult uh, dummy uh, to be representative of uh, thermal uh, human properties. Uh, child um, side is, uh, is more challenging for uh, detection uh, system as uh, we have seen uh, in uh, mice crop for before. Um, now let's have a focus on dummy position that we propose in the protocol. Uh, if we want to be sure that the safety function of robotic system works, we need to consider uh, dummy positions uh, that represents the greatest uh, challenge uh, for the system. As a first approach, we propose a line position with a dummy uh, on its back. So, so this position on the back corresponds to the lowest height from the ground. Um, the first case can be the case of a dummy lying in the working direction of a machine. Uh, the, um, the dummy surface detected by the machine's perception system is minimum in, in that case. The second case proposed is the dummy uh, lying on its back perpendicular to the machine directions of, of travel. And finally, the third position is the standing position, which is the, certainly the, the most common one. So now um, a picture to describe the, the protocol uh, when uh, we run the, the, the test. Um, based on the key factors I described before, we propose the following principle of the protocol. Look at the um, schematic diagram. I don't know if there is a sensor. No. No license sensor? No. No, no it doesn't, doesn't work. So, <laughs> Um, the machine shall approach the dummy and uh, shall stop before contact is made between the dummy and the rigid parts of the machine or its implement. So on the right you have um, uh, the machine and uh, in dark it's, uh, its implement. Um, we use artificial vegetation, so the, the two rows uh, up and at the, at the bottom. Um, the, um, and um, the machine and, and its implements, so I said before, the different dummy locations, so you have uh, three, three locations uh, of a dummy. Um, the, the first one is at the middle uh, uh, of the trajectory of the machine. The second one is uh, one meter, uh, don't, uh, one meter in, the, in the vegetation. Uh, in a row, and the, the third one is one meter after uh, after the, the vegetation. Uh, uh, it is for a U turn situation. Okay. Second, the dummy uh, is arranged in line down position. Uh, at the reference points, so, so you have the same three location, but the dummy is lying down position, so it is the, the second test. And then the, the third uh, test, uh, it's the, the last position of the dummy, is to put it perpendicularly to, to working direction of the machine. So, so here you have an equivalent in case of uh, Staddle machines. So we consider also um, a work uh, on several ranks. 
As for the interval case, we propose uh, three locations uh, for dummy. Uh, locations are done regarding the right of way zone of the machine and the uh, ranks positions. And now some uh, information concerning tools and, uh, and metrics. Uh, an absolute laser tracker records the autonomous machine position and speed during all the tests. So you can see uh, this uh, measurement system on the picture on, uh, on left at the top. Uh, an optical sight is fixed on the machine for tracking. And uh, to check the speed of the robot, the robot is monitored, as you can see on the graphs uh, on below. So you have a graph of, uh, of the speed uh, of the machine. So the laser uh, telemeter can measure the distance between uh, the optical site, which is uh, uh, fixed on the machine, and itself. And, so, and we can record uh, all, all the measurement. If, success, if the test is uh, successful, we check that the robot is in its safe state and the minimum distance between dummy and machine is measured. Oh, here is the list of operations uh, that we propose to be carried out to perform the test. First, um, the, user the user manual, the configurations, um, maximum speed, maximum load, dimension, also all the information that we have in the, in the user manual of the robots. Uh, second, um, uh, the, we receive and prepare the robot with a manufacturer. So we need uh, some uh, engineer or technician uh, person from the manufacturer. Third, we check uh, the, the robot, uh, the system version running on the robot, uh, the sensor orientations, uh, compliance with technical uh, documents, and, uh, and user uh, manual. Then we measure the dimension and the weight of the machine, and we keep uh, uh, an instrument of the machine uh, with an uh, optical uh, sight, uh, for example. Then we learn or pass on the mission to the robot and uh, ask, uh, install the um, laser tracker uh, near, the, near the track, near the test zone. And then we conduct a dry run uh, of the test. At the end of the test, uh, we check whether the collision was avoided or not and uh, measure the distance between uh, obstacle and machine. We carried out uh, all mode uh, of operation, forward motion in autonomous mode, reverse motion in autonomous mode, and so on. So we check all the modes which are possible with a machine. And during all these tests, we record all the test data and condition in, uh, in parallel. Um, this uh, slide shows an example uh, of a uh, test um, uh, with uh, in rail robots, so it's an example of uh, running the, the protocol of tests with our robots, uh, with our dummy, and so on. So this video contains uh, four small videos. The first in the top on left comes from a thermal camera embedded on our robot. In the top on the right, a video comes from a GoPro camera on the robot. Uh, video in the bottom on the right comes from a static camera. It's, it's just to have a, to have a video of a, of a protocol when, it's, uh, when it is running. And uh, the last one represents uh, a top view from a laser tracker data. In October 2022, uh, uh, INRAE and UTAC uh, organized uh, the 21 uh, OECD Biennale test, uh, engineer conference uh, at Agrotechnopole uh, in Montauld in France. The objective uh, was uh, to share uh, advances in terms of uh, safety function test uh, protocols for agricultural robots. 
So at this occasion, we present some, experiment, some experiments using our protocol of states of safety functions. Uh, we have also some conferences and meetings in order to share about uh, the use of, uh, of a protocol of tests with uh, all the, the country, uh, countries uh, um, that uh, will be that are no that were uh, represented at this occasion. Sorry. Um, our proposal of test protocol is built uh, following the concept of um, PRL uh, proposed in the Cover European project. Uh, PRL uh, means uh, protocol readiness uh, level. It's like um, a TRL. Uh, currently, the um, ARPA4 protocol is in PRL3. That is to say that the first version is proposed to robot manufacturers who are highly uh, interested in the thematic uh, and who want to make uh, their first suggest suggestion for improvements. We project to be in PRL6 uh, in June uh, 2022. So at this uh, moment, we will be able to publish uh, our, uh, our test uh, protocol. In conclusion, the um, Agrotechnopole is now proposing uh, as an agricultural robot test offer the, free, the first free protocol presented in 2021 at FIRA, um, ARPA-1 uh, test of anti-collision system, ARPA-2 test of perception system under harsh environmental conditions, ARPA-3 test of geofencing system, and we hope that at the middle of um, 2023, uh, Agrotechnopole will be able to propose a test offer for ARPA4 protocol. So for all this offer, if you are interested, you can contact um, Sharpa Engineering, who is our operator for all this test. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry, but uh, we are uh, still in late. <laughs> uh, so we are 10 minutes in late. So this, is, uh, this was the last uh, talk of the presentation, so of the session. So I suggest that if you have some questions uh, about uh, this test, and I'm sure that there is a lot of, uh, you can do it uh, during the break, uh, the break, the coffee break uh, right now. We are supposed uh, to start in uh, 10 minutes, so I suggest that we uh, uh, keep the break of 20 minutes, so we get back for the last session at uh, 3.50. Is it okay for everyone? So, thanks again to the speaker of this session, and see you in 20 minutes. <laughs>